Good morning. My name is Fence Robertson, vicar here at Grace Lutheran in Boone, North Carolina, extending to you on behalf of the staff and the people of Grace a welcome to worship this day. I have three announcements to make, the first of which pertains to our Christmas cantata. That will be December 4th at 10 a.m. in this space. So come on out to hear some familiar carols on December 4th at 10 a.m. during our normal worship time. The second announcement pertains to the giving tree that is set up in the narthex. Uh, if there, uh, and on that tree are uh, ornaments, and on those ornaments are ministries outside of this community that we support. If you wish to support some of those ministries, grab an ornament and check out those instructions and how you can support those ministries out in our community. And the final announcement pertains to um, the Vickers Project. Yes, it's called an Advent Observed. Um, I'm happy to announce this to you all. You are invited to tune in and listen to an Advent Observed. It's a, a daily devotional podcast featuring Grace members and friends sharing their faith perspective on the season of Advent. There are some instructions that are floating around in the weekly news. Check those out in terms of uh, where to find it and how to either sign up for it. So I hope that you'll check that out. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad in it as we begin our worship time together.
Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be God's name forever. Amen. Beloved, now is the time to wake from sleep. Let us confront our sins and confess them to one, to the one who is merciful and just. God of new beginnings, we confess that we have not welcomed your holy reign. We have strayed from your paths. We prepare for war instead of peace. We dishonor one another and your creation. Purify us with your refining fire and set us again on your way of love, that we may bear fruit worthy of repentance and welcome your coming among us. Amen. People of God, a new thing is growing in our midst, a tender branch, a living sign. By water and the Spirit, you are joined to this wonder. You have put on Christ, and our sins have been washed away. Let us rejoice in the way of the Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and so we begin by lighting the first candle of the Advent season. We pray. Praise to you, O God, our salvation, who is near. You hold us in our waiting and keep us awake to the world. You show up in our lives at unexpected times. Bless us as we light this candle to keep vigil for your arrival. We trust that even though we do not know the day or the hour, you hurry to gather all people to your peace. Amen. For our children's message today, I'm going to go back to our Spark Bible because it has in it our first reading for today, which is from Isaiah, uh, which connects to our gospel reading from Matthew. God will bring peace is the name of this story. Isaiah was a special man who gave people messages from God. Trust God, he said with excitement. Count on God to take care of you. Someday God will send us the Messiah, the great Savior King. Isaiah shared a message about a time in the future when everyone will get along and live together in peace. He said, soon the mountain where the temple of God is will become the highest mountain of all. People will shout, let's hurry to the mountain. We will learn about God there. God will settle arguments between people. They will stop making weapons that hurt each other. Instead, they will make tools like rakes and shovels that will be helpful. People will not go to war against each other anymore. Then we will all live in the light of God together. It gives us an idea of something we could do, a little project if you'd like to try at home. It says, draw a peace sign and then decorate it and hang it somewhere in your home for everyone to see so that we can look and be reminded of God's peace. This is a really interesting story because Isaiah is talking about something that's going to happen in the future. And this season of Advent is a season when we look toward the future. And in the same way that Isaiah is sharing a promise here, we gather around promises for a future that God creates for us. And we do that all season long during Advent. And this future that God is creating, well, it looks like peace. It looks like people getting along with each other. And maybe even the, the weapons that we use to hurt each other might become the things that we use to till the ground and enjoy in God's abundant creation together. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Fill us with your promise of peace in you 
and help us to see your abundant love everywhere. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, About that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of a house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As I was working on my sermon for today, I was reading through the Matthew text we just read, and we get this encouragement to be ready, for the Son of Man will come at an unexpected hour. And it got me thinking, what does it mean to be ready? Well, our text from Matthew doesn't necessarily say, but as I was reading some of the other lessons for the day, I was struck by our first reading from the second chapter of Isaiah. Hear these words. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. What does it mean to be ready? Well, it might look as Isaiah speaks about, of lives that begin to point toward justice, righteousness, and peace. I got to thinking this last week about the arguments we sometimes have, and hopefully it's not too timely of a question on the heels of Thanksgiving. Why do we disagree with each other about things? Why do we have arguments? Why do we have wars? I got to thinking that it might have to do with this idea or sense of scarcity. That is, the idea of not having enough, or maybe not being enough. Maybe most of our arguments and disagreements are centered on this challenge, that we must contend against each other in order to get our share, because there is not enough to go around. And so we live our lives in a way, in a continual comparative analysis of what we have versus what our neighbor has. And it could be money, respect, acknowledgement, authority, whatever it is. But we've conditioned ourselves to walk in this world in a way that constantly focuses on what we lack, what we do not have enough of. And maybe this season that we're preparing for Christmas, well, maybe it is hurting us more than helping us. Maybe it causes us to contend more so with others than ever before. 
In our first reading from Isaiah that we heard just a second ago, we hear promises of God's intention to reveal to people something true about who we really are. That when we gather in worship, God's presence is near and it is known. That's what Isaiah is imagining, that the temple that they've built would be so filled with the presence of God that all the other nations, all the other peoples would look at the temple mount and and say, yes, God is there, and they would be drawn to that presence. This is the vision that Isaiah has, that all the nations that had been at war with each other would find themselves moving in the direction of the temple, but even more so in the direction of the presence of God. And that there in that place, they would learn the ways of God and desire to practice those ways in their lives. But that's not necessarily what the people in Isaiah's time wanted to hear. You may remember a bit of the history of Israel. We had the 12 tribes of Israel and they ended up in Egypt and they were enslaved. And God called out Moses to lead them out of bondage and into the wilderness. And then Moses and then Joshua led them in a meandering path toward the promised land. And when Joseph was dying, it was time to hand it over to the next leader. And instead of choosing one person, he chooses a group of judges. And those judges rule and arbitrate for the people and are designed to enact God's justice. But eventually, things start to be more challenging, particularly because the people have entered the promised land and there are other people there. And they must figure out what they're supposed to do and what they decide is that they will go to war and they will attack others and they will defend what they have conquered. And finally, the people are looking around at the other nations and they say, God, wouldn't it be great if we had a king And God pushes back on that idea, saying, a king will just take advantage of you. And they say, no, we need a king. And so they choose Saul. Saul, the great warrior, will be the first king of Israel. And he will lead them in victorious battle as a powerful military leader. And so it continues, just like other nations, as God said. The rulers of Israel started to operate in the world in which they had to contend on the battlefield in order to control the scarce resources of the dirt on which they lived. But over time, they discovered that there were other nations around them that were terribly powerful. And for centuries and centuries, they fight and they battle and they're conquered and they win battles. And their whole life is set up in contention with the world around them. Their whole life becomes focused on a war making that would preserve a temple or a place or land. But the prophet's clear from the onset that the temple in Jerusalem and all of the promised land is is special not because it can be defended. It's special because the presence of the Lord can uniquely be discovered in that place. And that when God's presence is accessible in such a place, the rest of the world will take notice. It no longer will be the little area that the Israelites hold to their own, but all the world will see and know the Lord. And when God intervenes and makes this happen, as the nations are drawn together, will begin to discover a peace with each other. And my sense is that this peace is a byproduct of a different gift, and that is abundance. Scarcity and abundance. Scarcity causes us to fight and contend against each other to get our little bit. Abundance, on the other hand, shares from what it has, believing that there's more than enough for everyone. 
if the presence of God is free and accessible to all, then there's more than enough to go around. And more and more and more can be invited in to share these gifts. And I think it's really telling then what happens to the weapons of war in one of the most familiar verses from that passage, that the swords will be beat into plowshares. The swords and the spears, those instruments of war enacted by scarcity, will be transformed into instruments of harvesting an abundance. And my sense is that this is where our disagreements with each other come, when we contend with each other. And instead, what Isaiah is imagining, and something that I, I believe we also can be uh, imagining together, is a future with so much abundance that our lives are made in peacemaking, and that our ways are reconciliation and not division. We look for common ground instead of what we disagree about. And I think this type of promise shakes the foundation of a world built on scarcity. It shakes the foundation of a world that says we have to contend and elbow our neighbor out in order for there to be enough room for ourselves. And instead, we find our lives in generous giving. Martin Luther described this in his, as he talked about the life of discipleship. He said the first aspect of a life of discipleship is gratitude and thankfulness. He talks about that long before he talks about obedience and faithfulness. That when we are drawn near to the presence of God, we'd say in the waters of baptism, we are brought into the presence of God in those waters, we discover ourselves anew, that we are created by a God who also creates every other person and every other thing in this creation that we share. And that we are engrafted into God's work of bringing broken pieces together. And that's only made possible when we receive the fullness of that abundant gift of unconditional love that we call grace. And so our ministry in this place becomes one of invitation and welcome so that more and more people can stream through our doors and hear a message of abundant love and grace for them. They can begin to imagine their lives not caught up in contentious scarcity, but instead awashed in God's abundance that turns in love generously to neighbors around us and begins to enact more and more fully God's work of reconciliation and peacemaking. What are the things in our lives that need to be brought back together? What are the things in our world that need to be brought back together? How will we be shaped by the teaching of God's peace filled with the abundance of God's love in this creation so that we can be God's co-creators of peace in the world around us. Amen.
with the whole church, let us gather in saying the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our prayers today come to us from Beth Revis. As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that yearns for new hope. God of all, your children everywhere cry out for mercy. Awaken the global church to the urgent needs of our time. Equip us with you to break down barriers of culture and custom, to unite people of all faiths into, in your redemptive in healing and healing work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth's beauty and abundance is your gift. Teach us your ways of sharing resources and caring for life. Guard fragile habitats that are among us. Preserve the wild places that's ar that are around us and protect endangered plants and animals near to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace, you judge the nations. Beat our weapons into tools for serving our neighbors. Strengthen the resolve of all who strive for an end to war. We pray for lasting peace in the land of Jesus' birth, Israel and Palestine, and in other areas, especially in the places where there are conflicts, such as in Ukraine and Russia, Afghanistan and Iran, Yemen, Haiti, and Myanmar. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of loving kindness, you desire fullness of life for everyone. Fill those who, are, who hunger. Comfort the grieving and attend those who are dying. Bring help and hope to any who are sick or needing your care, especially those we lift up to you now, either on, in the silence of our hearts or on the whispers of our lips. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, you are present when we gather in your name. Give wisdom to our congregational council, staff members, and ministry leaders. Keep us, alert to unex keep us alert to unexpected opportunities for mission. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of promise, your goodness is everlasting. We give thanks for the lives of the faithful who now rest in you. We trust you will bring us into the company of all the saints with rejoicing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your Spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. I invite you at this time to pause our worship video and head over to our church uh, website at graceboon.org and check out the donate page and consider where you might want to step into ministry together with us as we serve those who are in need. Let us pray. Eternal God, make the desert bloom and send springs of water to thirsty ground. Receive these simple gifts of bread, wine, and money. Make us messengers of your mercy and love for all in need of your healing and justice. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing. God, the eternal word, who dwells with us in Jesus and who holds us in the grace of the Holy Spirit, bless us now and forever. Amen. Friends, go in peace. Christ is near. Thanks be to God.